So I start with a sort of a general question, and I want to start uh, by just asking each one of us to share a little story about Julian Bream, or um, uh, perhaps not a story, but a personal feeling of how his music uh, per moved each one of these musicians. So I'm going to start with Fred, who not only uh, was my former teacher, but who is the only one here who actually studied with Julian Bream on a Fulbright scholarship. So, Fred? Okay, well, thank you. Um, what comes to mind is that when I was 15, I fell in love with the Ravel Pavan for Dead Princess. And in fact, I was playing uh, an edition of it for solo guitar. And then I heard Julian Bream's recording. And I said, well, I'm never going to play this piece again unless I can play that transcription, which was truly magical. And lo and behold, about eight years later, I was sitting in his house, and I said to him, I've always wanted to play your transcription of that piece. And I was really very nervous. I mean, I thought this was like the culmination of a dream to play this. And I was so happy to uh, finally feeling I was going to acquire his transcription. And he said, well, I never wrote it down. He said, I was seeing this bird at the time, and she fancied the piece, so I played it off the piano music. And that was kind of the end of it. <laughs> so I went home, and I had a lot of time on my hands, and I uh, transcribed his, his uh, performance off his record. And I came, at, I came back to him a few weeks later, and I played it for him, and I didn't tell him where it was from, and he just said, well, that's very nice. <laughs> So that's, that's my fond, uh, fond recollection of him. Bill. Well, I, I wish I had the experience you had of getting to study with him. Um, I, I, none of us really had that direct experience. But I think, you know, when you mentioned how we were all so eager to do this, I think that part of the reason is none of us respect a single guitarist alive today more than Julian Bream. And, and it's, it's not just because of his great artistry, you know, as a, as a performer and of the, how he took the guitar from where it was at, at the time, but if you think of all the areas that he was an innovator, where he, early music, how he essentially started the early music craze mm -hmm. single-handedly mm -hmm. by starting the Julian Bream concert, having new pieces commissioned by the greatest composers of the day. And for me, like one of the most, the biggest inspirations was the ensemble work he did. You know, Scott and I will finish the program with some duets that are from the, the famous uh, tour he did with, with John Williams. When I first heard those duet recordings, it just blew my mind. It was just a whole new idea about what a guitar ensemble could be. And I think it was one of the reasons I decided to be really involved with guitar ensemble. So. Um, the lack of hesitation, on, at least on my part, and I think I speak for everyone, is because he, the guitar would not be what it is today without what he did. David. I agree wholeheartedly. I think, you know, if you look at every part of our repertoire, he explored it. Spanish music, classical, Renaissance, everything. Um, I happened to come to the guitar from the piano, and I had been playing Beethoven and Mozart and all this great repertoire, and it was his LP called 20th Century Guitar that so excited me. It had some of the pieces you're going to hear tonight. It had the, the Nocturnal, for instance, and the Frank Martin, and I just realized at that moment um, that there was a world here that I wanted to explore. Um, I'll just tell you that I first met Bream after a concert when I was a student. I was very young and very brash. Um, and I had this thing about an earlier Takamitsu piece called Folio. So I just wanted everybody to play it. And I just thought it was the greatest of things. So I brought it with me backstage and I said, I loved your concert, but you should be playing this piece. And he said, <laughs> he said who are you? And I said, well, I'm really nobody, I'm just a student, but I just love this piece. And he said, well, actually, I'm traveling around with that piece, and I'm interested in it. And that's when we f I first met him, anyway. And he just seemed to be open to anything that was of quality like that. So. David? Yeah. Quality is the word. He is um, certainly my favorite guitarist of all time. Um, and uh, uh, that quality was felt in, in recordings that I heard from the, some of the earliest classical guitar recordings I ever heard. Um, I heard him in concert a number of times before I met him, uh, which was finally when, uh, it was not all that long ago actually, I guess in the early 90s, 
when uh, Richard Rodney Bennett wrote his sonata for the guitar, and uh, Richard Rodney Bennett lives here in New York, uh, had written it for Bream, but Bream was uh, across the pond, as it were, uh, so he asked me to do some, some uh, editing for the piece, some preliminary editing, and then um, when Bream came to visit next time, uh, Richard was insistent that we meet, and I was all too thrilled. And uh, so we met at Richard's apartment, and, and Julian was, was very gentlemanly and incredibly musical and statesmanlike. Um, and he invited me out to dinner afterwards. We had a lovely dinner, had a lovely time, and I had seen him now several, several times since then. Um, he's a giant, uh, not only of the guitar, but of music in general. He is truly a great artist. Scott. Well, I, um, I, I very clearly remember my father bringing home an LP. Anybody here still have L LPs? I, yeah, we were, we were trying to think of our favorite Bream recording, but they, they've all changed the titles, you know, with the re-releases and everything. But um, my father bringing home two LPs one day from, he was going downtown, this is in Detroit, and um, he came home, and I, I had just really started taking classical guitar lessons seriously. One of the albums, and I, I'm sure he got them because they were in the front of the bin. He didn't know the guitar at all. But um, the first one was Julian and John, the old purple LP with the very 60s psychedelic print on it. And, um, and the other one was uh, Bream Plays Bach. And I remember looking at the... Julian and John album, you know, Julian, uh, Julian Bream and then John Williams had the long hair, and the Bream Plays Bach album, and, and they had this, it was on an old Westminster um, uh, LP, they had kind of strange ideas for covers, and uh, it had this guy with a tennis racket in a tennis suit, a rather <laughs> hairy guy, uh, but you could only see the back of his head, and he had a tennis racket, and, and facing him, was this guy with long hair and glasses and kind of a frilly shirt with the tennis racket. And it's obvious to me now that one was supposed to be Bach and one was supposed to be Bream. But at the time, I remember looking, I think I was probably 11, and I remember looking thinking, who is Julian Bream here? Is that Bream? But then I would look at the Williams Bream thinking, well, Bre Williams has the long hair, so who's the guy with the long hair? And it was really confusing. Um, but um, as... as as they've all said, uh, for me, the, the key word uh, with Bream, uh, the, the one quality is magic. There's this magical um, essence that he brings forth. It's certainly evident in his recordings and in his concerts, too, when he would swagger out on stage and, and just sit down and start playing. These moments of magic would happen, and, uh, and I've tried all my life to really get that. I'm still trying, probably will always try. There's that Bream magic, you know. Um, so anyway, there, I could go on and on, but really it was the first albums that I had. Thank you. I'm, I, I'm going to tell a little story. You're probably wondering what this beautiful bag is here. Um, I had the honor of picking Julian Bream up uh, from his hotel, uh, I think in 1992 or something, uh, and take him to the D'Addario factory, Great D'Addario Strings, and then to the um, airport. So uh, I arrive at the hotel and I'm, I'm so nervous, I'm so freaked, I'm just so freaked that I'm gonna like drive Julian Breen. And so first of all, I get to the hotel and it's in Midtown, it's the Warwick or something, I, I, I can't quite remember. I think. Anyway, so it's like if in the 40s and I, I arrive and he's sort of, <laughs> sort of just got up and he said, oh, well, Bill, you can do a much better imitation, but you know, basically, uh, Ben, Come back in an hour. Okay, so I drive around town and I'm, you know, for an hour. Then I come back, I pick him up, he finally comes in the car and we drive out to Long Island and it starts to rain, crazy rain. And um, then I realize I don't know how to get to the D'Addario's. Like, something happens when I go to Long Island, it's just the roads change, everything f changes for me when I drive along. So now I'm driving my hero to this place. I don't even know where I'm going. Uh, <laughs> I, I get out of the car and, and I go and, and to, to a McDonald's and to, to, to call. My friend Jim says, you know, I, I think I'm on the right road. McDonald's doesn't have a phone. I have to go to Burger King. 
to another place. And meanwhile, Julian is just walking around totally fine with everything. And I'm just, you know, completely a mess. So finally, we go to the Diderio, we make it to the Diderios, and now I drive him to the airport. And, uh, which was harrowing. It was just so much rain, and we're talking, and I just started at that time to love wine. And, uh, um, you know, not that I love it now, but, um, and so uh, he starts talking. I say, you know, I understand from your book, he's wrote the greatest book, you know, uh, uh, on the road. Life on the road. L Life on the road. Just incredible book. Um, and uh, I, I, he, he mentions the wine cellar. So he says, well, you know, Ben, I'm, I'm really kind of burdened um, because someone gave me this bottle of wine. I, I hope the person that gave it to him is not in the audience tonight. Um, um, anyway, um, and I really, you know, just don't want to take this around with me. And would you just keep it for me? Uh, until I come back to town. And it's, it's a 1974 Petrus Pomerol. I got news for you, it's a very good wine. Anyway, so what, now I got this wine bottle of Julian Bream's, this, and I knew it was an incredible bottle. So year after year, he would come and I'd go see him play and he'd say, no, 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 you know, I, you know I, sorry, I can't see you now. And, and, and I, I even remember John Williams being in my apartment and saying, John, you know, you're a good friend. He says, can we just drink this because I don't really have a wine cellar. I'm, I'm just flipped that it's going to turn into vinegar. So finally, I go to see Julian at the Manhattan School, and he's teaching a, a master class, and he's getting in the cab. I said, Julian, what am I going to do with this wine? He says, you know, Ben, just drink it with someone you love and think of me. So... <laughs> The people that I drank it with are right in this, right in that row, Joe and Marilyn Schwartz, and I pretty much knew they'd be here, and uh, Joe and Marilyn and my wife Rhea and I drank this bottle, and, and, and we did think of Julian, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to move on and sort of go into um, further detail, uh, which has been slightly mentioned by everybody, and just ask people. Um, to be very specific um, about qualities of Julian's musicianships and guitar playing that really uh, have influenced you, or, or perhaps in other pieces you play, maybe not just even the repertoire that he actually played. But as, as we've mentioned, this was a man who started his early music, he commissioned pieces, he had an extraordinary range of color and articulation, his fingerings, um, it goes, the, the list goes, his, as, as Scott mentioned, his incredible stage presence, you know. Uh, so there, there are so many aspects to, to his, uh, a, as a performer and a musician. So if any, specifically though, if you, a few things that you might want to share. I'll just start with, with Fred. Well, the thing that stands out for me is his incredible rhythmic drive and rhythmic energy and vitality. Uh, and that he infuses that in every style of music. Uh, the other thing is his enormous uh, range of tone colors. I mean, he could get the most exquisitely beautiful sound, but he's got the best Ponticello I've ever heard. And, you know, sort of, and uh, also, he would always talk about the architecture of a piece. And when I was studying with him, I had no idea what he was talking about whatsoever. But over time, I, I came to realize that he saw things in a very big way, and that when you were really required as a musician to tie things in and not just look at one section or another, but to ha have a, a large view of the whole thing. And I think this was, a, he, he was a real a visionary in that way. Bill. Well, I, I was going to talk about color too. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, but that's, but, no, no, but go, you know, go how ahead, can you go not, ahead. How can you not? How can you not yeah, talk exactly. about color? Because, you know, I think many people, when they just think about guitar, it, well, it's sort of a monochromatic thing. You just sort of strum around. And he, it really is, is a complete orchestra when he's playing. But I, I, the only thing I would add to, to your comments for me is his ability to sort of get at the heart of what the piece is about and to unabashedly communicate it to an audience. And, you know, I think he wasn't one of those performers who sort of hid behind this sort of veneer of, of formalism and, and put a barrier between himself and the audience. But he... He laid it all out there, and in you know, good and bad, you know, and and but it was always expressive. There was always something very personal that he was sharing with the audience with every performance. I would add to that that there's a kind of freshness to his playing that stayed there through the years. And um, in interviews, he talked about the fact that he really got away from the guitar and recharged his batteries. Um, something that I think a lot of us of this generation have a hard time doing. We all teach and we travel around and we do all our stuff, but he is a master gardener. 
um, he just does other things and he never really had a regular teaching job. And so I think he was able to maintain a real kind of freshness to his playing throughout decades. I love everything everybody said so far. The, the, the thing about Bream is that everything that's wonderful about his playing is so wonderful and it's so colorful uh, that it's very easy really to talk about it. Um, I would add to these things that he has an impeccable taste in everything, impeccable. And um, he also has an overarching sense of spirituality or a, a, a belief in a higher power um, that, that you may only sense or feel in some way from his performances. When you speak to him, you really, or when you hear him speak, even in public, you, you, you get that. Um, and I think that infuses everything he does with uh, tremendous authenticity and, um, again, a, a spirituality that is uh, really quite powerful, I think. Um, I, I could go on, but let me pass it along. Well, I think they've about said everything. I mean, I, uh, uh, I was also going to mention color, tone colors, uh, timbres that he got out of the instrument. That nobody ever really I've, I've heard from then until now has really succeeded in, in, in even exploring what he did. Um, certainly have tried, but uh, you know, there's still, um, and again, the freshness that you mentioned, uh, it, that, that's one thing I always got. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to see him many times in concert. And of course, I have all his albums that have been listened to thousands of times probably by now. And, and, um, and you know, they never get tired. They never get, I never get bored of them. You know, some recordings you, you, you hear and uh, you think, okay, well, I heard that, been there, done that. And I can always go back and listen to something of his and, and really get something new out of it. It's, it's, it's pretty incredible. There are very few musicians like that. So. It's, it's interesting. Uh, you, you, well, I, I will just add one, one thing that was so inspirational to me, I, I know for, for all of us, was just his unrelenting um, devotion to new music and that every year I would see him, I'll never forget him doing the Royal Winter Music, which David champions. Uh, and you know, people, it was tough. It was a lot to listen to. And he put the music out of, you know, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the piano bench, sprawled this music in front of him and just went through this music uh, with everything he had, you know, at the, at the edge of his seat. And it was exhilarating to know that every year you were going to hear a new work. You just knew it. Um, and that really influenced me tremendously um, uh, in, in, in commissioning people from, from the time I began to play the guitar. Um, but but we've, we've mentioned the word color a lot. One of the things I think is interesting, do you, or do you all feel influenced by his choice of guitars? Because, Fred, he did have guitar makers actually live on his property, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to say something about his choice of instruments? And well, he, he tended to favor uh, spruce top guitars and guitars that were very kind of crystalline, the model being the uh, Hauser guitars and Hauser uh, replicas. Uh, he did experiment. He was always open to things. And from time to time, he'd bring, you'd see him playing a Ramirez, or you know, you'd see him playing Spanish guitars. Uh, it certainly. In, in my own trying to duplicate or imitate, I should say, his sound, I tended to go for guitars that were more along the lines that he was playing, yeah. Anybody else want to say anything about his instruments? I would just say that I was influenced by the fact that he found the right guitars for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wanted to do that for myself, not to find his guitars, but mine. Right, right. It's, a, it's, a, it's another sort of part of his, his innovative personality that we f sort of forget, is that he would just encourage these guitar makers to, to, to make guitars for him. Well, we're, run, we're running short, as I knew, I, as, as I knew we would, but, but we have time for one, uh, a couple of more quick qu questions. Uh, we have mentioned recordings, um, but I did want to say, ask each person, you know, if you had to tell your students to, to listen to, say, a performance or a, 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 or a record, we've mentioned a, a, a couple, but what, a couple of records that you would say, I absolutely can't, you know, Desert Island Bream, Dream Bream tunes. Well, I think we all agree 20th century guitar is just like 20th the, century guitar. The ultimate, yeah. but past that, I have to say, I'm particularly fond of Baroque guitar. 
now if you can find it, you know. Uh, but what pieces were on that? Uh, the Vice Pasacalia, among others. I mean, that's the one that comes to mind. I think the Vice the Tombo suite. also. The Devise Suite. The Devise Suite, yeah. Yeah, which was a huge. Yeah, go ahead. Malcolm Arnold guitar control. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Malcolm Arnold. If you if you if you don't understand this, just yell. We'll yell them out. The Malcolm Malcolm Arnold. You're going to be tested on this, by the way, when you <laughs> when you leave. So there's a little questionnaire. Uh, uh, David. Well, we were mentioning that CDs, the repackaging may have different titles, but there was an old LP called The Woods So Wild. Oh, oh. oh. yes, I love the yes. Woods. A little picture of him by the, you know, yes. near the Woods So yes. Wild, but yeah. near the pond there. Yeah. I love that. Love that cover, Scott. Yeah, Scott going over. That's a good cover. That was a, that was good, a good cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah good, and, good cover. And and I was in 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 you know um, listening to his recordings basically when I was a kid. You know, I I did judge books by their covers. You know, this looks like a good record because it looks really good. And so that looked I still really good. Do. I think that's fine. Yeah, except the Bach and Julian Bream record. But um, for me, it was you know obviously the the contemporary music. But as a as a kid listening to this, I was just so impressed with his classical music, the Diabelli. Uh, mm -hmm. Giuliani Grand Overture, Giuliani Grand which I, one of, of the here. pieces I learned when I was a kid because I heard him play it. And, and the Diabelli Sonata, which uh, of course he kind of pieced together from different sources, just ma amazing, magical. Well, that, that's another great, I'm sorry, David, go ahead. Well, actually, I'm, I, w I will just say the 20th Century Guitar album is the one for me, but I, I, I should really add a little bit to the talk about the composers that he, he commissioned and, and went after because if you just think about some of the names of the people right. that he went after to write for the mm -hmm. guitar, first he went into England, into his own country, and he got Benjamin Britten, William Walton, uh, Richard Rodney Bennett, Lennox Barkley, uh, Michael Tippett, uh, Malcolm, Maxwell Malcolm Davis. Arnold, Maxwell, Maxwell Davies. Davies, thank you, Alan Ross Thorne, and then he went out abroad, and he went to Hans Werner Henze and Toru Takemitsu, and he tried Vitol Lutoslavsky, he tried Ligeti, didn't and, make and, and the Stravinsky. Stravinsky, you, almost <laughs> came. you got to buy that DVD. You have to buy that. Yes, right. yeah, this, yeah, great, That's an great amazing moment. bit and of footage. Champion de Martin, absolutely, which was ignored. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So I mean, just an incredible list of composers. Staggering. Staggering. And you know the Lutoslavsky. Yes. Arrangements. His yes. arrangements, too. Yes. But, but you were going to say something. There's two recordings we haven't mentioned. One is, uh, that are landmark, I think. One is the Julian Bream Consort. Because okay. when that came out, it was just like no one had ever heard lute playing like that before. That's right. The other recording that I think is astounding is the recording he made with George Malcolm of Bach Trio Sonatas and Vivaldi yes. Trio Sonatas. Mm. Yeah, but I, I'm with Scott. I, I, I heard that the, you, that was another thing. You know, you heard the Diabelli, and you think you want to play that. So then you go... And, and I remember thinking, well, you know, Julian, he, he messed with it. Once I found out, like you found out, that, that, that he actually put different movements together, then you go and buy the Diabelli, right? And you play, and you go, you know, maybe he had something here. <laughs> it's like the best arrangement. It's like incredible that he would just say, well, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm just going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to, sorry, Diabelli. Well, we haven't even mentioned his commitment to Spanish music, which, yes. was, which was vast. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. just a survey of almost everything. And we also didn't mention Songs of the Chinese. Songs of the Chinese, yeah. yeah. Right. You know, and, and his collaboration with, with Benjamin Pe Britten, of course. And Peter Pierce. Yeah. And Peter Pierce. You know. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Well, I'm afraid we're, we're, we're done. We're, we are going to come back. I think we're going to... We, do we have something to do tonight? This stuff? No. You know. You're going to go home? Yeah. I got stuff. I got stuff I got to do. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> some stuff. Anyway, um, we have one question. Quick. Does anybody know what happened to the Rose Augustine Hauser that Julian has? Had? The last time he played in the United States, he was playing on it. That oh, okay. was, what, five years ago? Is it on Three eBay? He played it on <laughs> His house was. <laughs> His house was on eBay? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, he just... He a, a, buddy just of mine, a buddy of mine uh, bought his lute, the lute that he plays duet with himself on that video. Oh, and, and, yeah, and he, he, he thought, this is the coolest thing. I've got Julian Bream's lute, you know. <laughs> And mm -hmm. I Indeed. think he meant L O O T. I think that's what he was. <laughs> but anyway, but a, but a boom. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but a boom. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, uh, thank you very much. And we'll we will be back. We'll be back. <laughs>